this is a talk about a sort of a follow-on to the talk I gave last year at Plumbers. Um, last year was more of a, hey, look at the stuff we're going to do. Well, this is the, I hope we, we've done most of the stuff we said we we're going to do. Um, so the, the main talk, the core of the talk is about the Nouveau project where we're going with the thing called the GSP firmware. And then there's also a section on work we've done as part of that project to sort of like make a GPU virtual memory address allocator manager because, yeah. Everyone should have a virtual memory address allocator in their life. Um, so the first step is, well, what the hell is this GSP? Where have you, anyone, the Nouveau project, the Nouveau project is like the, the NVIDIA uh, re reverse engineer driver that we ship on Linux. Um, for years and years, there's been, you know, our, our relationship with NVIDIA has had ups and downs. Um, they started giving us well, originally, we used to reverse engineer our own firmware. Over the years, that kind of got harder. They started using signed firmware. You can't, re you could reverse engineer, but you couldn't re-implement it. You couldn't put it back on the device. So they started giving us firmwares that we could use, but those firmwares were generally not fully featured. Uh, those number of years, we got these semi-featured firmwares that were enough to turn on the screen and do some acceleration, but you couldn't re-clock. Device was slow. So. That situation is that where we were on the it's like we had our use space driver, our kernel driver, some little firmwares and the hardware. And the kernel driver talked to the hardware to talk to some of the firmwares and it, it kind of worked, but it kind of sucked. Um, and that's where we, the project kind of really stalled for a few years because no one, there was no real incentive to develop fast user space stacks or new features because you couldn't do anything with them. The, the, I think the main feature I developed in those years was the ability to turn the GPU off to save power. It was like, that was the best thing to do with it, was switch it off. So yeah, we didn't have a lot of motivation. Um, yeah, and that changed kind of recently. Um, NVIDIA re-architected their uh, GPU designs, starting with Turing, uh, and they added a RISC-V processor that was slightly larger than previous RISC the little microprocessors they had, had a bit more oomph. And they decided to move a bunch of stuff from the driver into this firmware blob. And that firmware, they told us we could use. So we're like, okay, well, we're allowed to use this firmware. It does all of the reclocking. It does all of the, you know, the hardware initialization, talks the hardware. The driver doesn't have to do that stuff anymore. So it was like, well, there's some pros and there's some cons in that in that decision. Um, the biggest pro is reclocking is now possible. That means we can at least start to compete with the proprietary driver that NVIDIA developed. Because, yeah, you can go fast. You can actually get your GPU to run at the speed it was designed to run at and the RAM to run at the speed you wanted to. And that, that opens up a lot of things for us. Um, Another big pro of the GSP path versus what we had before was the firmers NVIDIA were giving us before were not the actual firmers NVIDIA used themselves in their driver. So a lot of the time it was like, this is broken. And they're like, okay. And then four months later they go, oh, that, we found that bug. You know, it's like uh, one guy, it just, they didn't care that much about them because you know, they weren't using those firmers. They were specially written for Nouveau. Uh, you know, they might have been used internally for other stuff, but they were not very useful for getting, especially when a new chip had come out that they'd say, this definitely works with that firmware. And you're like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> and then six months later, like, you're right. And you're like, okay, I know. <laughs> so yeah, so the big thing with this is, this is the same firmware that they're shipping with their driver. So we at least know if it works with their driver and it doesn't work with our driver, our driver has a bug. It's like, our, our, you know, we have to figure out what the hell we're doing wrong. Um, unfortunately, with the pros comes, the cons and the cons are quite quite long and not fun so I, I think the biggest well actually I don't know which one of these is worse uh, I'll go with the first one though uh, there's the firmware design that uh, NVIDIA kind of chose is the standard NVIDIA driver has you know it, it has like a, a version that goes all the way from the kernel or from the hardware all the way to like up into Vulkan, OpenGL, uh, CUDA runtime so they lock all of that into one thing and they build it all themselves from like one place. So it's like, they don't really have ABIs. It's more of a, oh, I need an RPC to call from here to here. Oh, we'll just 
add another RPC or we'll just change that RPC. And it's like, so the, 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 this may change, but the current uh, firmers we're getting from NVIDIA have absolutely no guarantees at all of anything remaining stable. Some stuff might, but you can't like, and it's not even like, oh, yeah, I don't know if I'm familiar with the NVIDIA versioning number, they go like, they've got a 535 stream currently and a 545 stream and a 550 stream coming. In the middle of the 535 stream, they completely rewrote how the message passing worked. You know, it's like, they don't, stability to them doesn't actually mean anything in terms of that number. It's like their internals of their driver is just what they do and, you know, they, they decide themselves what to ship. So they don't care about redesigning everything right in the middle of other things. So you can't, when we first looked at this, we're like, oh, well, we could just take a 535 driver as our baseline and we'll just put new versions of that into the firmware tray. So we just got one of these, we just up it and the kernel should stay compatible because they won't change it in this. No, 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 they did, they did it straight away. So it was like, okay, well, we know not to do that, but that brings a big problem. So these firmware files are large. You're probably used to like, oh yeah, 64K, 256K firmwares. I think these are in the 20 meg to 30 meg range. And there's two of them. Uh, one for Turing and the first couple of Ampere cards and one for Ampere, Ada and onwards. Um, so guess what? You do not want to have a lot of these sitting on your system. You don't mind them sitting on your system, but you definitely don't want them in your slash boot partition uh, or in your init RAM FS. Or if you're on a, most distros, your init RAM FS has, you might have three init RAM FSs. You might have five init RAM FSs. Every one of those init RAM FSs will have every firmware we list as a requirement for the driver because that's how we've always generated init RAMFSs. We just take the list of firmers that the driver requires and stick them all into the init RAMFS. Again, if the driver, so say we're on this 535XY and we move to, we also want to ship a 545XY and then we want to do a 550 as new hardware comes out. We have to keep all of those on the system because the kernel has to be able to work. Old kernels need to still boot, new kernels need to be able to fall back to the older firmers that they can't find the newer ones. So your system ends up with, from now on, it will be an ever-increasing number of these. Over, hopefully we can minimize how many of these over the years, but it will be a, we need new hardware support, we need a new one, CVEs, we need a new one. You know, so it's like, these is going, it's going to get, it's going to be a lot more of a problem. Um, our current plan for that is, no plan. Uh, half a plan. Uh, what we're doing right now is we are not changing it willingly, easily. We are like going to be very, very strict on when we rev this. Uh, I've sent the one to Linus that was like the, the one that I had finally gotten working after two weeks and I was like, no, we're not moving again. But, you know, we can't control that completely. We, uh, my, my sort of secondary plan is I've done a couple of patch sets that let the driver uh, put a list of firmwares together and it will provide that list to user space and user space only has to pick the last one of the list and put that in the init RAMFS. Because at least that'll give you a little like reduction. It should only have one or two in the init RAMFS as opposed to seven or eight. Still though, 20, 30 meg firmers are gonna piss off people that configured their slash boot 10 years ago at 500 megs. So yeah, don't have a good answer to that bit, but yeah, we are. We have considered a couple of things in Fedora. Maybe we could, pull the firmers out of the init RAM, out of the separate init RAMFSs and put them into a common init RAMFS. So then you would have your just one per kernel and one with just the firmers. That would at least reduce the multiplier of having multiple kernels. Someone has suggested we just leave the firmers sitting in slash boot somewhere and hope that we can get to them, but I'm uh, not sure that flies too well. So we have had some suggestions that we just do not load the driver until we've mounted root file system. But unfortunately, there's a lot of system, well, not a lot of system, but one of the corner cases we get a lot is you get a laptop that has a external, the external displays are all connected to the NVIDIA chip and the BIOS doesn't turn it on. And if you boot, you can't type in your passphrase if you boot with the lid closed on your laptop. And people apparently do this. So. <laughs> yeah, would be nice. But yeah, these are the cons. We will, we will try and reduce this. Uh, we, we, we will try and work with NVIDIA to help them do ABI design, but who knows? <laughs> so, so what's the current status of this GSP work? Um, well, the first thing that had to happen to use this firmware was we had to refactor a bunch of work in the driver. So um, I don't know if you, everyone's heard uh, So Ben Skeggs was the Nouveau maintainer. He just recently uh, retired from that position. 
Uh, he did all of this work before that. Uh, so he refactored all, most of the sort of the lower level stuff wasn't so bad, but the display code needed a complete revamping to like about 10 years ago, we were like, oh, NVIDIA do display quite different than us, but ours works. <laughs> now we have to do it exactly like they do. We had to redesign that. It was a lot, it, it, it turned out to be some random ass display port feature that we had never thought implemented that was causing a load of bugs. It was like, okay, we implemented that and it suddenly started working. So weird corner cases. Um, but yes, all of that refactoring and preparation was done. And then the GSP patches were layered on top. Um, the refactoring and present prep, prep work went in in the start of the merge window. And then I sent a, a begging uh, merge request to Linus going, please, 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 please. And obviously he was so enamored after BcacheFS, he was quite happy to merge it. So, okay, so <laughs> he's like, well, I've already done that. This won't matter. Uh, so <laughs> so it's, it's merged in 6.7 RC1, uh, which is good. Um, it's only enabled by default if you own an ADA uh, um, add a card or laptop. Uh, for Turing and Ampere, you have to pass a command line argument just to turn it on. There will be a point, I think, where we will just switch over because at least some of the Turings and some of the Amperes just never worked with the firmware we had. And, and NVIDIA were like, well, you can either have us work on that or we can help with this. So I was like, okay, we'll just push forward, leave that, leave, try and leave that behind. But we'll, we'll try and I'd say what will happen is we'll give an option for distros to switch over and we'll just let them do that instead of the upstream kernel. And maybe in five years we'll do it. Um, there are unfortunately a few missing features in the regressions we've had just because we haven't figured out exactly what we have to call in the new API to do all of these things. Um, proper re replayable faults don't work, which means like the SVM feature that we kind of have in there that no one really has used too much yet. So it's not you're not going to really notice it in normal use. Uh, we need to get proper fault handling. So yeah, with the old driver, if your game does something stupid, or your app does something like does puts a pointer to the random place, you used to get a sort of a detailed uh, little bit of logging. Now you just get a crap happened. You know, sorry. Uh, you know, you, you've lost your context. But we're going to work on that. It shouldn't be too hard to figure that bit out. Um, sensor monitoring doesn't work at all. So we don't know how to talk to the thermal subsystem, whatever the hell's on the other side of the thing. It's, there's possibly a bunch of, it, it, it could be done anyway. I don't know whether it is, there's like a bunch of API calls we have to call periodically or whether it's something we can set up to report it through a separate status page or, you know, we, we have to probably figure out how that actually works. Um, but one of the, so that, that's kind of where we are now in terms of like regressions compared to the mainline, but one of the future things we have to work on. So. When I said we had all these firmwares from NVIDIA, they come with a whole load of include files. And the structs are all in these include files, and the structs always have the same names, and the structs don't always have the same contents, and although John will, doesn't like hearing it, sometimes things get added in the middle of structs. Um, so there's, how the hell are we going to deal with that? I, like, we have a bunch of C code that needs to include a bunch of header files with the exact same struct names do we fork all of the C code every single time NVIDIA changes the headers? It, it's, yeah, we, it started getting into like, oh yeah, we could get away with this once, uh, but after about a year or two of this, it's just going to be an unmanageable nightmare. So I, I have raised with the, the, the team that's working on this and considering, especially with the uh, work that the Asahi Apple GPU driver has done, and they're interacting with a similar kind of problem in that they have a fixed firmware with versioning that they have no real control over, um, an ABI that doesn't actually exist either, that you know, maybe we should consider a, a reboot of the driver uh, into Rust, just a GSP only driver that would just be going forward with Nouveau just, just on these firmwares. Um, even if we don't get as far as a complete reboot of the driver, we would consider maybe at least writing the piece of the driver that talks to the firmware horribleness in Rust, so we can at least dynamically do a lot more of the, you know, if we don't do it in Rust, we'd probably end up having to use Python to generate the C code, so it's like, uh, not really sure which is going to go side. I kind of feel doing it in Rust would probably be a lot nicer than trying to get Python into the kernel tree just to generate C code that I'm going to compile. So yeah, we will see. But I'm I'm, I'm pushing in that direction with the, the the team that I have it read at, and we'll see how we go. Um, so that's pretty much the 
the GSP part. GSP was um, it, it it it's a pain, but it it will. There there actually is already Python in the kernel tree. I know, but it's in two. It's in the good part, isn't it? I don't think it's actually in the like building part. Linus doesn't see it. Is I think how you put it's it nicely. Just, it's just deep, the stuff I know about is debug tools. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So Fair yeah. point. It's uh, I had that. It's like the other option is you can use Perl. <laughs> no one was no one was interested for some reason. So that, that's that's the GSP. It's where where we are with that firmware. It's getting there. So, but the other part of it is well, now that we can reclock. How can we make a modern, useful driver? What you know? What's what's missing from Nouveau? It hasn't really had a rearchitecture in ten years. We should probably, you know, look at what what's happening in the in the area. Um, so I'm just going to give a little small, short history lesson. Um, graphics cards, generally in history, has video RAM, and they had a thing called GTT, which is graphics translation table. Well, what it means is system memory in a, like a page table where you can linear, it can make things that are in random places in system memory look like linear objects inside in the, in the graphics card. And for years, that's all we really had. We had physical memory management. Um, how we dealt with that from the user space was the user space would submit a bunch of like handles to the kernel when it was submitting a job and the kernel would then go through all those handles and relocate to the actual physical addresses. Uh, it worked for a lot of years, but it's slow and it takes a lot of overhead. So finally, GPUs grew virtual memory. It was like, okay, now we don't actually have to do these relocations anymore. We can actually get the address of the object and just put the address in. It saves a lot of overhead, makes things a lot easier. Um, these generally, the virtual memories were like per context, per process. You know, we would generally do a per file descriptor open. Um, and that, that kind of works. But, um, Again, we started off with then with a couple of other a couple of technologies we had in the kernel. We had the, the, these are just good overview of the terms. So we had gem is like our buffer object management. So this is when a user space wants to create a buffer, which is just really a bunch of pages either in VRAM or phys physical memory. We, we call it a gem object. We had the TTM layer, which was more for the, uh, managing the sort of discrete RAM and dealing with evictions between video RAM, evicting to system memory, evicting to swap, and how all that worked. We had a, Bunch of generic code that does synchronization objects and fencing, which is like where you, oh, I'm using this memory right now. When I get to this fence point, you can move it. But as long as I haven't reached the GPU that hasn't reached that fence point, you can't move that memory. Um, and then the initial work, nearly the initial thing that everyone nearly did with their virtual memory, uh, which Nouveau had done, and I think Radeon and everyone had done, was they tied the allocation of a buffer object, so a gem buffer object, they tied the allocation of that to a physical or to a virtual memory allocation at the same time. And this was sufficient when we were just dealing with OpenGL. It, it gave you the, the ability to, it was easy. I think it's probably the best way to describe it. It was like, I don't have to change much. I just, when I create an object, I just give it a virtual address space. But the world moved on. And a thing called Vulkan came along. And Vulkan is a, a new graphics API. I say new, it's possibly seven, eight years old, is it? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's around a while now. I think I can say stop saying new. Uh, a replacement for OpenGL. And one of the features that like baseline Vulkan pretty much brought in was a thing called sparse memory. And sparse memory is user space virtual memory. So the, the user, the, they manage it. The user process is in charge of managing the virtual address space for it. So it can say, I just want to allocate this a virtual memory in this address range. And then I want, to, I want this object in this bit, or this object in this bit, or I want to drop that object out of that bit. And it also brought the feature of having both synchronous and asynchronous updates to that virtual memory space. So you could go, you could set up a pipeline of GPU, do this work. And then make all these page table adjustments, and then do this work, and then make all these page table adjustments. And between those jobs, you'd have fences to say when to set go, you know, when to stop, when to go. Um, that's kind of gets complicated. It's starting to get, you know, uh, the drivers suddenly had to do a lot better. You couldn't get away with the every time I allocate an object, it gets an address because they weren't one as to one anymore. They had to be 
you know, you had to be able to put objects anywhere in the address space, and you could put the same object in multiple places. You could put ranges of the same object in. You know, it just wasn't sufficient. So we've, I think the term for what we came up with as a solution was this thing called VM bind, and I think that just came out of this. Someone named an IOCTL that one time, and now we all just call it that. But it was. Um, Before I get into the details of what that is, I'm just going to, a little digression. So if you look in the, the DRM uh, code base, we are very, very big on like trying to get as much commonality as possible between drivers. We don't tend, if you look at like a vendor driver that comes out, they generally do try to do everything themselves. And they're trying to do reinventing wheels is like their thing. It's like, oh, we've got a whole team to reinvent that wheel. Let's use it. We don't really have that luxury. So we try to keep the wheel, one wheel per implementation of something. And we, we did really well at that with mode setting and the atomic work. That like the initial few implementations of that, we did a lot of common code. Um, we had Excel, for the, but for the acceleration side of drivers, we weren't so good. Gem kind of had a bit, TTM a bit. We had a GPU scheduler that was common, but used by one driver. <laughs> and attempts to use it in other drivers was that's hard, but at least it was in the right namespace. And I had found a lot of drivers had started to do their own VA management. I was like, okay, AMD sort of got this right. And then I saw, I think it was Freedrino, I started seeing Mesa, Mesa bugs come up going, these guys, have, the, the VA doesn't do something properly. I'm like, that should be common code. Like what, that, there's no reason you could get, should get that wrong because we should all be doing it the exact same way. There shouldn't be a choice for a driver author here on how this works. It's, everyone needs to be doing the same thing. The, the, it's dictated by the Vulkan API. There's like, if you're doing something different, you've probably done it wrong. So it just happened at this stage, the Nouveau stuff came up and I was like, oh, if I'm going to write a VA manager for Nouveau, I'm going to write a generic VA manager and use it in Nouveau. And then I had a better idea. <laughs> I'm going to get someone else to write. <laughs> uh, it just happened at that time that uh, Red Hat had hired a very competent engineer called Danilo, um, and he was putting my team. I was like, you, I, can, I can get you to do this. This seems like the, I can tell you what I think it looks like, and then you can tell me what it will actually look like. And we sort of looked at the AMD GPU code for inspiration. It was like, yeah, this seems to mostly get it right. Um, but we made a very specific thing at the start that we would be try to be useful for as many as uh, drivers as possible. Um, it happened at the time that Intel was working on a reboot of their kernel driver called XE. Um, they were like, oh yeah, we're doing this. And yeah, we're good to do this in common code. There's a, the, the Panfrost team was looking at doing something similar um, with ARM. So ARM had been starting up a new driver. So that team got on board as well. So we actually managed to pull, and this is what I like about when we do that sort of common code thing. And, is, is that it's not really about common code, it's about the fact that you have multiple people who understand the common code and can talk about it. It's like, that's the, the bit that's more, you know, when you have a driver and you're doing everything on your own, you can go into the woods, because you can you know, convince teams, that, uh, people on your team that of course you know what you're doing, you know, and they'll, they're all sub subordinate to you or something, your manager tells them you know what you're doing, so if they don't really dig in. That's, but when you've got that multi-vendor community of people, and who are willing to you know, actually look at your work, it makes a huge difference to the, like especially the velocity and getting the, the bug fixes. So that, it really has worked out in this area. At least we've had three or four or five people that are, know what they're doing and really got invested. So it's been good like that. Um, we're going to hopefully, not saying Alex, uh, port it to get someone to port it to AMD GPU at some point. We tried to make accommodations as much as possible for how AMD GPU worked. It was first uh, the first driver to do this, and they had a lot of different requirements. But uh, I really like MSM to port it, if, I, if Rob ever hears this. Um, but and one of the things was we, I, I wanted to download a little, like, don't just go, go nuts, you know, learn. This is, we want to figure out how these things can work. So he did a lot of, trails, ran a lot of different corners, and like we made decisions, we tried it, I was like, well, I've heard about this Maple train, train team from Liam, and I've met Liam a few times, it seems like it should be cool for this, it's for virtual memory, you know, so, and he did, and he went off and spent like a month or so, we went into Maple Tree, we sent patches, he got it going, and then we hit a big, oh, and we had to back it all out, but it was like, no, nah, it's okay, we learned, 
we learned what we need to do if we'd ever want to do it again or we learned you know it was a lot of, a lot of good learning experience especially for him to get into the kernel and knowing other people and you know connecting him to other people so um you may ask what did we hit oh i jumped over that's exactly what happens in life uh, i'm just going to give this slide because it's because <laughs> liam kind of asked for it but uh, um we have this thing called the fence signaling critical section. And we, so I suppose the concept is we've got this thing called DMA fence. And the whole point of a fence is when, so, when you put a fence in, everything before the fence, all the memory that's before that point is pinned. And when the fence is lifted, you can move the memory. And that's how you, so your general submission of work to GPUs is you sort of, you know, you, you get a hold of objects, you fence them all, they're all fixed in time, you submit the work, and when the work is finished, the fence gets pulled up and all that memory is able to be moved. In reality, what happens is work fence, work fence, work fence, work fence. So it's not like you really can ever, you know, but you still, you don't ever want those fences to like, you can't have them like last forever because, well, what happens if your system's under a lot of memory pressure? You, yeah, GPUs generally will pin, 80, 90% of your memory, if you give them a chance, you know, they, they don't mind using all of your RAM, especially if you're like, you're running Chrome or something. It's like, yeah, it, GPU will pin the red bit of RAM that Chrome hasn't used. Um, so one of the problems with this critical section thing is that it gets called in from, so you, you can be, you can be in the shrinker. So you, you know, you, like I'm about, I've got a fence, I've got all the memory. And then the shrinker gets called and it's like, oh, I need to free some RAM. I need to, you know, give me some RAM back. And it's like, uh, you, can you wait in this fence? And I, I swear when that fence gets signaled, you'll get all this RAM back. It'll be, you'll be great. The shrinker, like, so it's like, so it does, and it waits on the fence. And then the code that's going to signal the fence decides to allocate some memory. And it's like, oh, I don't seem to be able to allocate memory right now because some the other guy is allocating memory stuck in the shrinker and waiting for me. And guess what? Your system dies. Deadlock. So there's like this is the, the critical section is yeah, you 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 back yourself, you can't make forward progress. We've had a few attempts by drivers. Again, one of the reasons why I love common code here is I've had a few attempts by drivers to make those fences into something that user space could signal. And then it was like, well. I mean, you, I've gone into the shrinker, waiting for the fence to signal, and then user space goes to signal, and it wants to allocate some memory. So the process that's going to signal it is stuck in malloc, waiting, never gets to the signal, and then the kernel is deadlocked. But you can't even detect that one. That's like a, you can have, like it's a graph through user space of what could cause that. And, but like the suggestions given often were from people that with, that, with those driver implementations was, well, we'll just eat time on try again and it's like yeah that's not really solving the problem it's like so but and i just found out i just read this scenario because i convinced someone uh, to write some documentation and they did um not alone can we not only not allocate memory in that fence signaling pad we can't take any locks that other people might lock and allocate memory under <laughs> and that makes it even more annoying because like you're very limited what you can do in this critical section. And one of the things we kind of want to do in that fence critical section was update the page tables. And with Maple Tree, the problem was you generally had to fall back to, you could pre-allocate stuff, but you had, if you had to, if you got there and you hadn't got enough nodes and you had to split stuff, it would try to allocate. And the pre-allocation side, you either have to use GFP Atomic but you had to use it a lot. And it was like, okay, this is probably pushing what you should be doing with GFP Atomic. Or you had to pre-allocate a lot of stuff. And the amount you had to pre-allocate was quite a lot if you had to do it for every page table path that you had. So I'd like to see if we could resolve that over time. But for now, we fall back to an interval tree, which may have the same problem, but has it in a lot less of a, of a problem. <laughs> it's, it just needs a lot less pre-allocation. So what's the, the current status of this work? Well, we, the VM bind API for the Nouveau kernel driver, uh, the initial information of that, which pretty much covered this GPU VM work, the synchronization objects and the scheduler integration, uh, that all went upstream for 6.6. .6. 
and that kind of enabled the the Vulcan driver to get to get moving. Um, there was a bunch of improvements though that like the initial one was like but we had some naive things and we were like taking a lot more locking and reser reserving objects a lot more than we needed to and someone pointed out you should just do this and we're like oh yeah we should just do that but then it took us two kernels to actually go from oh we should just do that to actually figuring out how to do it and getting it right uh, the, the scheduler has seen a lot of changes as well they, this is the generic scheduler that went from being one of these in your system talking to one hardware ring to one of like X number of these per file descriptor, everyone has one. It, it needed a lot of work to scale up to that, and that work's being done now. Um, so that's in progress for 6.8. I think it's all in, no, all the generic bits are in DRM MISC next, but the nouveau bits are waiting for me to read them, approve them now. Um, but with that, it's like we've got the sort of core of a, a modern GPU driver for the NVIDIA hardware. There's, for, for graphics and Vulkan workloads, computes a bit more, probably a bit more work, and there's a few other things like host pointers and stuff that we don't quite do yet. But um, yeah, it, it, it's most of the core. That plus reclocking really sort of sets user space free, at least to start considering. So what, what's, what happened in user space in that time? So I'd like to say all the, most of that work that's been done prior to this was uh, done with Danilo at Red Hat and the a couple of people from Calabra and a couple of people from, one from AMD interacted and a few from Intel. So it was a good group of people uh, working on that. Uh, I was more of a, I was just standing around watching it and testing it on my laptop and going, it blows up a lot. Um, and yeah, getting it ready for Linux. But so the user space driver, uh, Fate Extra and the Calabra took this task on um, and has pretty much done most of the work. I think myself and a couple of others have you know, jumped in every so often, added you know, a few little extensions, done some groundwork to get it going. But um, it is, it's a Vulkan driver for Nouveau. It's, we initially brought it up using this old, the, the old compiler we had. The old compiler is, was not very well written. It was, for, it was probably six or seven years since anyone really had done anything with it. Um, so Fate had designed a new compiler, which is called NAK, just, it's, yeah, it just got merged into Mesa last night, and it's running already much faster. I think we went from like 20 FPS to 1,000 FPS with lots of like demo apps and stuff. So it was like, yeah, we really need this. Um, I'm hedging this because I'm not actually sure how close we were. We were, there was a conformance run that completed and was successful. I can't remember if it was 1011, but um, we're close to doing conformant Vulkan 1.0, 1.1 on Turing. Uh, Ampere needs a little bit more work, but yeah, it's it's pretty close. Um, so it, it, it's come a long way in that year, in the year. Um, I think our forward looking is just get Vulcan 1.3 out the door. I think the kernel's going to need a bit more. Um, you know, I think the GSP work's going to get a bit more integration, and I think there's going to be a lot of bugs to fix. Um, you know, Ben's departures kind of mean we have to move move people around to try and cover that gap for now but i think we've got a bit of coverage on it It might slow some of the work down that we were trying to do but in a good position to move forward um but yeah if anyone has an nvidia laptop and wants to try get six seven rc1 get the new mesa unfortunately the new mesa needs a new meson which needs a new rust or, or it needs a new meson and new rust so it's a really that yeah what interesting is the NAC compiler is written in rust that, that's a, 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 another sort of like we're trying to use Rust for more things, and that's a, an implementation of a Mesa compiler written in Rust. Um, any questions? I do have a demo, but it's in my bag, and I don't know how to plug it in here. <laughs> so I'm also afraid to plug it in because I haven't actually plugged the monitor into that laptop Dave, yet. But I can Dave, take the laptop Dave, out and hold it Dave, up. There's uh, uh, one correction that uh, NVK oh. will be conformed in a couple of weeks. There we go. So that's fate conformed in a couple of weeks if no one in Kronos complains. So we're just waiting for the 30 day timeout. All right. So it's already been submitted at 1.0 for conformance. Thanks, Wade. Any questions? So at the risk of learning the answer, why does signaling offense require allocating memory? Oh, no, no, signaling offense should never require allocating memory. But 
Okay, that's okay. The, the problem <laughs> is that people question. don't get people don't didn't get that message because it wasn't well documented that you shouldn't be doing that in there. And then all of a sudden, we found out later. Is there a way that we could get some amount of like static analysis for that kind of callback where you could say, I know I'm never calling through a function pointer, and I'm always only going to call these things that do not take that do that cannot hit kmalloc. We have we have a very sketchy locked up annotation that. Uh, Sima Vetter wrote, mm. and unfortunately, the minute you put it into any driver, everything explodes. So we're trying to work our way through yeah, putting sure. that into the drivers to make everything explode when you're developing, rather than when you're using it. But okay, thank you. Uh, so, so I, I'm sure you don't want to hear this question, but um, can this uh, can the new uh, new driver or new driver API work with old? NVIDIA cards such as the like a, a first generation Maxwell, will that work with the with with this new Vulkan API and so on? So yeah, yeah. So the Vulkan driver currently is Turing Plus, but we plan to get it going Maxwell uh, Kepler. Yeah, back to Kepler probably. But unfortunately, the reclocking right. won't be there. But like, but there, but there's, but there, but there are, well, there old old uh, like first generation Maxwell had reclocking. So yeah. So, yeah, so you get it uh, yeah, yeah. If you've got a, a, a an old Kepler or a first gen Maxwell, and you've got the reclocking patches, and they work on your system, yes, then you would be able to reclock and get Vulkan. But yeah, unfortunately, everything between Mas Maxwell two and I think it's probably Volta, uh, Pascal or Volta. That's yeah, it's going to be a wasteland, unfortunately, for reclocking. Um, uh, what? Would not blocking shrinker and just returning that hey I can't really shrink anything, would that actually avoid that deadlock? No, be well it would avoid the deadlock, but it would also unfortunately just have your system run around because the whole point of the, the I think I think Liam you asked me that question yesterday. It was like yes, but the GPU is probably locked ninety percent of your RAM. You're not going to make any forward progress. You're just going to start failing KMALX all over the place. Like you really want it to stop doing what it's doing and give you back the memory so you can get forward progress. And then it's like, yeah, it would yeah, be nice to just go e timeout, but no. <laughs> yeah, it's usually. Yeah, yeah, you're going to get your the desktop blown away pretty pretty quickly. Is it something, I don't know anything about the shrinker, is it something where you could say reasonably like, I submitted a job to hardware, I'm pretty sure it's going to complete in a second, go ask other subsystems and then wait before invoking the oom killer because I know this job is going to, I, I believe this job is going to advance. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think the shrinker often doesn't get to us first, but yeah, uh, it could be something, but I, it generally, it's our fault. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, and I, and I think the, the workload you'll, that I keep hearing about from uh, people is if you've got one of those low end Chromebooks with like four to eight gigs of RAM and you're just browsing the web, you are constantly in reclaim, like constantly. And, th but that's the actual state of being for the machine. It's like it, it, you open an extra tab and it just swaps you out and reclaims and re reloads the whole tab again. So it's the default state of being in those laptops. So you have to not crash, you have to not deadlock, you have to be able to make forward progress. So it's like, yeah, being, and the GPU is probably using 99% of your memory on those. Mm -hmm. so it's... Okay, uh, we're out of time.